Good afternoon. Welcome to European Entrepreneurship and Innovation at Stanford Engineering. Today's topic is startup marketplaces and AI fintech big data, big data founders. Um, and specifically, our main speakers are Andreas Chas, CEO and co-founder of Pioneer Festival, Pioneers based out of Vienna, who is now working across Central Eastern Europe uh, as well as in Asia, uh, from the capital of of Austria, former home of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which uh, Andreas will say a few words about in a couple of minutes. And then our second, our, actually our initial speaker will be Nuno Sebastiao, CEO, co-founder of Feedseye, a very interesting AI-based fintech big data fraud detection and mitigation startup uh, out of Coimbra, Portugal, with operations here in San Francisco. Now we're moving to our main speakers. Our first speaker will be Nuno Sebastiao, who is CEO and co-founder of Feedseye. He's going to be talking about what is happening at Feedseye specifically, but also a little bit about the Portuguese startup ecosystem. Uh, Portugal has made huge strides in just the past couple of years, and in the last few months, uh, some really awesome and amazing things have happened in Portugal, which Nuno's going to mention today. So, Nuno, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for having me here. Oh, like that? Is it cool? Good. Okay. I did this one? Done? No. Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, I was going to start with that. I mean, what a difference a few years make uh, from uh, being a country that was under IMF bailout, essentially, bankrupt, to having uh, what I'd call, and I'll talk about it, a very vibrant uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem. And well, even me, I mean, uh, three years ago when I first landed here, I would dream of, of uh, having the investors I have today, and I'll talk about it, having the clients I have today, and being here. I mean, so what a difference a few years uh, make. So what do we do? And uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. We essentially uh, built through a combination of complementary know-how from, from the founding team, a risk engine that essentially makes commerce safe. I'll give some stats uh, later on, but we just surpassed a few months ago $1 billion of total volume that goes through us every single day. Uh, we will be at around $2 billion uh, in the next three to four months of every single day e-commerce volume that, 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 that goes through us. And that's from zero uh, two years ago. And um, I actually did not know as well. And uh, I come uh, from, uh, from Coimbra. What I did not know is that um, I was uh, the first uh, Portuguese to become a staff member at the European Space Agency. And here we have the European Space Agency sponsoring uh, this, this, this class. So it, it is indeed a small world. But uh, as Bert said, I mean, I come from Coimbra, a very small city uh, in the middle of Portugal, who happens to have one of the oldest universities, universities in, in, uh, in the world, dated back to the 12th century. The issue with that is like, yes, an historic university, but you have to keep up with, with pace. And clearly, Portugal was not known or is not known for its engineering uh, know-how. That is changing a lot. Uh, so this is uh, the, the campus, the engineering campus at the same university. And if you see the contrast between the two pictures, I would say that kind of like represents what Portugal is going through. From going this very, let's say, old, backwards-looking type of country to have really state-of-the-art, not only uh, buildings, but the people inside those buildings, more, more, more importantly. And, you know, Go ahead. What is the name of this university? Uh, university of Coimbra. Yes. University of Coimbra. Yeah, yes. public, this is, public, public university. Public school. This is the engineering department. Uh, I was one of the first, first students there. So they opened the first building there, I think it was in 97. And they built it and they finished at around 2006, 2007, when it, when it was complete. So really uh, brand new. And it's interesting because myself and uh, my, three co my two co-founders, Paulo and Pedro, um, we all come from that same university. We did went our separate ways when I graduated back in 2001. I went to Germany. Pedro came here to the U.S. with a Fulbright scholarship. Uh, he did his PhD in Madison. And Paulo went to Carnegie Mellon, where he did uh, also his, his studies. And we, I, we had no idea of going back to Portugal quite candidly. I mean, it was not until 2010 when I was at the space agency. And we happened to get together for a weekend. And we just thought about it. What if we do something 
um, crazy. What if the three of us do something that, I mean, we have uh, what it takes from an engineering standpoint. Let's go and build something. And it so happens, and I'll talk about that, and I'll say something controversial. There is a lot of money uh, in Europe. There's a lot of funding. It's typically starting with uh, European Union type of funding, but there is availability of funds there. So we decided to, with no idea as to go to market, we decided to or incorporate a company in Portugal and basically start our work. This was mid-2010. And, uh, no, no, yeah. sorry to interrupt again. Go ahead. Uh, and you were specifically out of the computer science informatics yeah. department yes. at yes. University of Coimbra. Yes, the three of okay. us. The three of and us. what were you studying there? Uh, so I majored in computer science. Uh, there we have a general uh, program that is essentially um, electronics engineering, electronical engineering, and computer science. I majored in computer what science. field of computer science? So my, my, my expertise was databases and basically what's, what you would call complex event uh, processing, which is a sub-area within, within databases. Okay. Pedro, Thank you. one of my co-founders, was actually my thesis supervisor back then. So he was once my professor, I'd call it. Um, and now we work, we, we work together. Paulo, his expertise come from distributed systems. And it's interesting to see how the three skills kind of like come, come together, especially because then at the space agency, I worked a lot in simulations and modeling, which I'll talk about when we go to what it is that FeedZai uh, does in more detail. Uh, but what I wanted to, to focus now is talk a little bit what I'd call the state of entrepreneurship in Portugal. And no, this is not the Bay Bridge. Um, there's a very similar bridge that happens to exist in Lisbon, done by the same firm that built uh, the, the Golden Gate. This was in the, in the 60s. Um, and this is one of the many similarities between Lisbon and uh, the Bay Area. Um, and we even have something like in Brazil, uh, Christ the Redeemer, if you'd call it. So, so but. There is a lot of similarities between what is happening right now in Lisbon and what happened in the Bay Area uh, decades ago or here in, in, in Silicon Valley. So let me give you an idea. What exists there that also existed here? Great engineering. So we have there uh, great engineering and ton of joint programs between local universities and Carnegie Mellon, UT Austin, MIT, MIT. I know there's even something in the works with, with, with Stanford, Harvard uh, as well. So there is a lot of cross-pollination between local people, local engineering know-how, and other types of uh, uh, know-how from other uh, universities like, like what we have here, and also with other European uh, universities. And there is a lot of support, accelerators and incubators there is a downside to it is this has all been very compressed in time. So all of this has happened in the last 10 years and I would even say more in the last three years. So there's still a lot of buildup that needs to happen. Engineering is there. What is not there is things like marketing, product. Um, and that's, that's why I'm actually here because there are skills that you still don't find there. But there are other skills, pure raw engineering, I mean, if you want somebody, someone to build a compiler or to build a database, you would find it there, that level of very deep type of, uh, of expertise. And there's, also, there's a lot of infrastructure. If, if Europe has built something, it's infrastructure to support all of these entrepreneurs. And it goes from places, offices for you, for you to be, to real incentives. It's different than here, so it's not what you'd call your institutional money. There's a lot of public money there. That's how mainly when you're starting, seed funding there is essentially public money, European Union money, uh, local um, development programs money. That's how, how you get, that, that's how we got started. We got started with, Europea, with uh, European Union money and only later we raised institutional funding. But there is, I would argue that no one can say that they cannot raise money in Europe or in Portugal. Uh, in, uh, in, in general. And as a consequence of this very compressed evolution in the last three years, this is the kind of stuff that you see on the media. Um, people have called it Europe's Silicon Valley because of the engineering pool, because of the location, well, also because of the bridge. Um, but people have really, and people take notice. I mean, it's very common uh, to have 
you know, the Y combinators of this world going and doing programs there. Yes, the same way they do in other cities, but there's a lot of focus going on there. And I would say that it's probably summarized by this. So how many of you know of Web Summit? Yeah. So people thought, I mean, Web Summit, Europe's largest tech gathering. I mean, it was historically in Dublin uh, because of that's where Google Europe was. That's where Facebook, Facebook Europe was. And they basically decided that they needed to grow that uh, location. It was not enough for them. So they actually looked at the number of places in, in Europe for various factors, logistics, but also an entrepreneurial ecosystem where they could really build, build upon. Uh, we know that there was a very competitive race between uh, different cities. And, but guess what? Uh, they're moving to Lisbon. And Paddy said this. Uh, Paddy, the CEO and founder of Web Summit, said that he chose Lisbon because basically the, inter the local entrepreneurs, we bombarded him, basically demonstrating to him why should he do it in Lisbon. And I, I sent him an email yesterday. I, I really wanted to have a quote from him. And I said, so what do you think? Do you think it's working? Do you think you did the right thing? And he sends me this email. Last year, it was their record attendance. They had 42,000 people. Only in September, they reached a 10,000 milestone. This year, we are in February and they are at 23,000. He was telling me, I don't know if I have capacity. And if we are today at 23,000 people there, how much will it be? 60,000, 70,000? And it's, 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 it's amazing. So, you know, just to clarify, are, are you and Patty saying that, that Web Summit in Lisbon will be bigger than the Global Entrepreneurship Summit here at Stanford this summer? How many people? Yeah. Oh, I don't know, a couple of thousands, a couple, few hundred. I really don't know what the capacity is. I, I, I don't know. I mean, yes. but if that you... That was if, a joke. That was a if you'd extrapolate, yeah. yes. it's, I mean, I don't know. It's, I mean, I've heard numbers like 100,000 people, potentially. Yeah. So I would say that this is much closer to a real global entrepreneurship summit than gov yeah. many government-sponsored yeah. entrepreneurship summits. Yeah, I mean, so. uh, they, they have a smaller event next to it, which they call Founders. And I was... Again, I mean, there's, there's many firsts, but I was the first Portuguese that they invited there last year, uh, and it was essentially me and the mayor of Lisbon. And they had their, I mean, Bill Philbin from Evernote was there. Um, one of the Stripe brothers was there. Um, in past attendees, Elon Musk has been there. So this is really a who's who, and guess what? Now it's going to be in Lisbon, so, I mean, it's... it's I think this just shows what happened to that country in the last three years. And then good things happen. These are, there's more. These are six companies out of Portugal that, and this is the amount of money that they've raised in the last nine months. So in the last nine months, you've had companies out of Portugal, one unicorn, Farfetch, that have raised from international institutional investors my investors are here and in New York, and the same with Venium, the same with TalkDesk, the same with Uniplaces, the same with Cedars. That have raised a substantial amount of money. When we first raised our funding, we didn't know how to transfer the money from here to, 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 to Portugal. Now, everyone's doing it. And this has been only one year time span. It is really a different, a different world. Talked about this, uh, a little bit about, about us on track to do two billion a day, total processed volume, so transactions payment, whenever you swipe your credit card, that goes, that goes through us. Uh, we have, uh, they're the, invest the investors I can put on the, on, the, on the slides, but we have other investors, for instance, Capital One is an investor. Think about this, one of the largest FinTech institutions, one of the most advanced ones in the world, let a, um, investing in a Portuguese company. We live truly in a, in a, in a global world. SAP Ventures or Sapphire Ventures, just around the corner, they're invested in us. And they were actually the ones, I'm so thankful to Anders Ranum there. He was the one that told me, I'll give you money, but you move here and you build the rest of the team uh, out of here. Because you have guys have great engineering, but you have no idea about product and you have no idea on how, on how to sell it. And that's absolutely true. It's changing, but that's absolutely uh, true. Uh, it's not yet, uh, it will be announced in the next weeks. We are the first Portuguese company to be named one of 
Europe's top 50 fastest, so what's called a tech tour, European tech tour, uh, top 50 uh, fastest growing startups. We just opened New York a few months ago. We're, I'm literally on a plane tomorrow to London where it's weird. A, a, a Lisbon-based company coming to the US and only now I'm, I'm opening my first office in, in, in London. I mean, think about that. I mean, um, And we're opening that. And we've been systematically doing 300% year over year since 2013. feel really, really, really happy with, with, with where we are. And I was also asked to talk about three things that or three learnings that I, that I had as a, uh, as a journey. And this is more for those of you that really want to go on entrepreneurial routes and, and, and build your, your startups, is what I've learned, having lived in Germany, working in Germany, uh, in Portugal, here is like technology, it's like math or music. It really transcends borders. So, I mean, you can really build a global company with all of these offices really fast today. I mean, and we look uh, at the nationalities I have, I have at Feeds, I, and I have people from all over the world. I have people from Russia, China, India, well, Portugal, uh, US, um, Norway, uh, Brazil. I mean, all sorts of different places I have people working uh, in the company. So there's really not a border for technology. Also, that, was, that is just important. I mean, when you're building your startups, it's important to have a purpose. Some people call it uh, product market fit, but it's really important to know what you're doing. What's the greater cause? People will join causes. They don't join technologies. What's the greater cause that, 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 you're, that, that you're working for? And then, of course, how do you scale it? I mean, we call it how do you make it big in the big city? So what we did, what we knew how to do as a company was to build these machine learning um, engines, combination of real-time data processing with large scale and building models on it. And this really combines the know-how from the three founders. I was building simulation models at the European Space Agency. I run the simulation group there. I had Paulo building distributed systems, and I had Pedro building real-time systems. It was a combination of these three skills that we essentially built, and it helped our technology. And it happened to be fashionable now. Right? So the original code behind Fidzai came yeah. out of Portugal? Yes. So Co the original Coimbra. code, yes. The original code was essentially Paulo and Pedro's research teams that we essentially hired the, the whole team. And because the alternative was, and this was 2000, mid, late 2011, the alternative was all of those guys would go abroad. That wa that's what was happening at that point in time. And we said, no. I mean, these are really smart people. We can get some funding. And we will keep the team together. So we did that. We kept the team together. I mean, we have people that have been there since, since that day. And today, just because they were there since day one, they run engineering for us. So our head of engineering is 26 year old. I mean, that, that, was, that was his first job. And I am so happy that we were able to provide him a platform to grow on as, indivi as an individual and not having to go and work and for those of you who work there, excuse me, and go and work for Google. I mean, it's, that's it. Um, so we happened to stumble on this technology, and we, we're building this technology, but we really um, uh, didn't have a purpose. And for those of you that know, I mean, machine learning techniques can be applied to very many domains, very, very, various domains. And, and, and the really important thing that we've learned, and actually a lot of startups in this space have also learned, is what's the problem that you're, fix, that they are, that you're fixing? Yes, you can use machine learning models to learn, predict, explain, act very many, many things. But what are you addressing it for? I mean, what are you building for? And we call this a purpose. So what we found out is through trial, through error, through our investors, our investors, and I mentioned SAP Ventures, but I also have Data Collective uh, out of San Francisco, so Matt Oko there. Um, they were really instrumental in telling us focus. I mean, have, have, have a purpose. Find your true north. What it is, is not what you do it, is why you do it. Why do you, do the, why do you build this technology? And just some, some data points. 16 million fraud losses a year. Um, and this is a, of, out of a universe of around 29 trillion of uh, e-commerce that happens every single year. So, Are those global numbers? Global numbers, yes. And this is not... So the problem, that the, or the, people, the problem that people are trying to address is not the fraud losses itself. I mean, that's, candidly, that's actually built in in the cost of doing business. And what people are trying to manage is customer confidence, is to make sure that people transact 
online or in what we call omni-channel or using omni-data, really transact across all of those systems. You go to a, to a, to a physical shop and then you, 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 you look at their website and make sure that all of that is done with confidence. So it's not so much about the losses themselves, it's make sure that it's safe. And it's so hard to do it in today's world. I mean, people have tried to do it with what's been called rules-based systems, so sim simple type of neural networks. And this is, this is actually a real chart of fraud losses where each of the bars is one day. And it's really hard for one person to look at this and see patterns there. So what we had to understand is that human-generated perception could not keep up to the levels of granularity that we had. Yeah. And by fraud losses, you're referring to credit card fraud. What, what other types of fraud? Uh, so we're talking about payment. So one, a large majority is credit card, uh, but there's also things like tokens or debits, prepaids, or even gift cards, uh, which there's very many s mechanisms on which bad actors act upon, and it's not... I mean, your typical use case that existed in the past was someone that would scheme your credit card, I mean, the clerk or something like that. That's not the case anymore. Today, we have very sophisticated fraud rings out there that really use these mechanisms to do business, like money laundering, uh, terrorism, uh, financing, etc. Okay. So it's really, and they do it in a very, there's very smart people on the other side, let's say, and they do it in a way that looks normal. So the important thing is to find those signals, those, those very sometimes thin, very low um, granularity signals that really can indicate that something, something's going on. And, and this is what we do. I mean, and we do it um, across the ecosystem. I'm happy to bore you guys to death with the machine learning and now we do it after. But we do it for banks. I mean, I mentioned one, one, one of our investors. We do it for uh, payment networks. We secure the largest uh, payment network in the US. Uh, we secure some of the largest marketplaces uh, in Europe, in Latin America. We secure the largest telecom in India. Um, that's just the kind of stuff that, that we do across the payment ecosystem. So the guy that gives you a credit card, so the bank that gives you a credit card, the merchant where you're buying, and all the people uh, in between. That's, that's what we do. And so that's our true north. We found our true north. And then the question is, once you do that, once you have, uh, as a startup, those initial proof points, how do you make it big in, in the, how do you make it in the big city? How do you scale? That was really, really hard for us. I mean, none of us had experience with a 50-person company, let alone a 100-plus person company across uh, five different offices. And how do you sell to these large, large organizations? And this is how or why I found out that coming here was actually instrumental. Candidly, and each case is a case, ours was not because of the, the local engineering here, was how do you build processes? How do you build as a, as a software, as a service, as a SaaS company, how do you build your revenue model? How do you really work that out? And now do you have a, a scalable, predictable machine that you can turn into a really large business. This, there's not yet enough experience in Europe. There's a few unicorns in Europe, but there's not a lot of really large companies in Europe that, where you can go and get talent to do those kind of things. And that's why I am here. We really need that kind of talent. We have hired here people from PayPal, Visa, GoDaddy, Amazon, and a bunch of other large organizations. Medallia, we have our first Stanford uh, grad uh, uh, that, that we recruited recently. How have we need those type of skills from those fast large organizations or fast growing organizations to, to, come, to come and help us? And there's very few places in the world where you can do that apart from, from here. So Forbes just said uh, about Portugal and, the, and, the, and, the, and, and I'll wrap with that about the Portuguese ecosystem that yes, I mean, historically, we've always looked at ourselves as the guys that you know, navigated around the world, Magellan uh, and a few others, uh, and, and, and discovered the world in the 15th century. Well, that, that was a long time ago. So uh, there's a young set of new people that are really looking at it. Can we become, can we apply today the same type of entrepreneurial mentality that we had at that point in time? And I truly believe we can. 
I see the cycle accelerating and accelerating in, in, in Portugal. And um, yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see if the, what happened in the last three years is synonym of, synonym of what's going to happen next. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. And that's it for me. Questions? Yes. Uh, is there a reason why frogs spike on that one day in the chart? There is. <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave about that. that so, so, very, so what happens is, and I'll talk about some public examples that happen here in the US, like uh, Target and Best Buy. So typically when when a data storage is attacked and let's say 40 million credit cards are stolen, then two things happen. There are markets out there on the, on the black web where you can actually go and buy credit card information. And that's one, so people actually sell that. But then what happens is there's a lot of attacks before the, the, um, the stolen, that the stol before it is known that that information was stolen. So you start to see all those spikes. And there's a case where in New York, People were literally in three hours because they know that there was a gap in the fraud systems. They were attacking all of the ATMs with a set of credit cards from that, from one of the heists. And they just literally had withdraw at that particular point in time. I believe it was something like $30 million in three hours. That was all with fake credit card information. Okay. Yes, Richard. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. Could you give us some tips how we should avoid uh, being defrauded. <laughs> uh, well, I've been myself, my, my information has been stolen. So, <laughs> so I, w I would start with simple measures. So one thing that it actually exists in Europe, which, which does not exist yet here, is that create these virtual credit cards. So you can create in Europe credit cards that are only valid for one transaction. So after that transaction, they're done. I mean, that cannot be done here. So what I would say is in physical stores, only pay with PIN, which most, it's happening, the swap right now. That makes it a little bit safer. And I would say online, um, be very careful. I mean, don't use necessarily the card information. Don't buy from a small website that does not have a PayPal button or something like that. And so refer to those more trusted type of systems, like PayPal or, or, or pay with Amazon payments or whatnot. And even for those, make sure that what I do essentially is I have one card that I do not have a big limit on that I only use, uh, and I know if my losses will be at most a few thousand dollars. That's, that's how I do it. And basically do not allow, I mean, which is very common here, like credit cards with huge limits. I mean, I would not use that credit card randomly all over the place. That's what I do. I keep a very tight limit on my credit card because if, I, if it's stolen, and it is stolen, uh, especially for me as I travel back, on, back and forth uh, between here and Europe. Um, I mean, at most I lose something like 500 bucks, but I still lose it, so there's no silver bullet. Thank you, Nuno. We're going to bring you back up again at the end. Uh, can we, Nuno, can we ask you to come back up here? Yes, sir. Uh, one follow up question to that. Do you think like we should have um, problems in the series A and B? When startup moved to the US, uh, their focus changes from the European market to the US market due to the investors are uh, more, they want to then focus on this bigger market. Or do they see them come here to raise the money but keep your focus on Eastern Europe? No, I think they are not coming here to focus on the, so of, of course you cannot, you can, never, you can never know, but I think in most of the cases they are coming here to raise money but to keep their, their focus um, on the market that they are already working on. Because it wouldn't make sense that you're already developing a market and then shift to another market. Does this answer your question? Well, I, I'm going to disagree with you a, a little bit here. I think okay. one of the reason, important reasons that startups come here, it's not just venture capital. It's to connect to early adopters in the US market, consumers and enterprises. This issue of early adoption is a big problem in Europe. There, mm -hmm. There's a huge lack of early adopters, both on the consumer and enterprise side. You know, we see this in the mid-sized family-owned companies, for example, across Europe that generally tend to be quite conservative in procurement, especially from new unknown companies. Also, the big firms 
So the companies I see out of Europe, many of them are coming here to open up sales and marketing offices, not just to continue focusing on their local European market, but, but to really begin getting early traction here in the US and then often going back to Europe with a stronger sales and marketing base and, yeah. and fund funding. Yeah. What, what I rather meant is that they are not stop selling in, in Europe. Stop. Yes. Um, of course, also develop the market here, but not stop to sell uh, where they are already based. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean, even that I would challenge. I mean, fintech. I mean, it, it's in general a very conservative type of environment in in Europe. I mean, banks have been around for 200 years, 150 years. So what we found out in our case is like I couldn't sell anything. I mean, a Portuguese company, bankrupt country try and go and sell to, let's say, Deutsche Bank or, or, or Lloyd's in the UK. I mean, it just didn't work. And, I mean, we couldn't pass their procurement processes. I mean, they, they were not prepared to work with companies that had 10 guys and no revenue. What, what, what I found out when I came here, and also more, more important than that, and I think that's all a consequence of, they would ask me, how do you compare against IBM? Or how do you compare against SaaS? And it's kind of like, I don't. I mean, yeah, technically speaking, we can, but I don't. I mean, they are large organizations. I'm a tiny little company. And what I found out here is that there's really a lot of early adopters. And we found out that all of these financial institutions, they have offices around here. All of them are here. And it's not offices kind of like to pretend or to say that they're cool and that they're innovators. They're really scouting out there for the best technologies that can give them an edge. And what I found out is that once you get one, then kind of like everything else falls into place. And, and then it's so easy to, to build a strong base here that then you go to Europe and you say, yeah, we're still a small company, but look at my, look at my clients, look at my investors. I have some of the largest um, technology companies as investors, some of the large fintechs. No, I don't pass any of your procurement. I don't have three years of a balance sheet to show you. I mean, that's, they ask you for, give me three years of a balance sheet. And it's like, well, I don't have it. I'm sorry. Uh, um, and, and, but then it becomes easier. But still, I mean, it's a, way, it's, a lot, it's a lot harder in Europe, in my mind. We have time for one more question. Yes. Hi, I have a question for you. Um, if you think about how you got to your first early adopters, was it a plan? Did you go through them? Did you select them? Was it by chance? It was funny. So it was the same as my first investors here, right? I pretty much knocked on all doors, and some of them opened. So I mean, it's very physically, pretty much physically. So so I mean, I I was so frustrated when I first came here at the beginning in terms of I mean, I spoke with all of the investors. I mean, people would keep me waiting. People, I mean, all sorts of different because I mean, I was coming from Portugal. I mean, that's not what you. So, but a few of them. They listened, and they look at the pedigree of the people they were able to separate. So they listen, and they say, OK, fine, I'll give you a shot. And what they did very smartly, some of these investors, they did not give me money immediately. They told me, go and speak with this guy, I mean, Matt Oko. He was instrumental for us, because he was the guy that then put us in contact with Capital One that then gave us, a, let's say, OK, fine, I'm going to throw a couple hundred K at you. And from there, it just snowballed. So a lot of it was. I mean, don't give up. People here, here's what people have here that they don't have in Europe yet. People here share a lot. They, they, they'll introduce you to people. They'll, they'll kind of like, they'll write. I had a partner from Foundation Capital. They did not invest in us. But in half an hour, he introduced me to 20 different other investors, just like that. He didn't have to do it, and he did it. Some of those guys are today my investors. So, I mean, you know, I mean, if you have the foundations and if you have a credible story, Someone, someone will understand it, and someone will say, I, this, is, this works. I mean, I trust these guys. And another thing that really helps the decision process is so much faster. For good or bad. I mean, I fail or, 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 or yeah, here's some. It's so much faster. In Europe, I'm still, I'm still trying to develop some clients in Europe before I left, that I started developing before I left here. And that was three years ago. So that's it. Mario, any final thoughts? from Startup Grind Europe's perspective or yeah, your own the, experience, the, London? Probably the biggest issue in, uh, in the European countries is the scale. Uh, the, the knowledge behind how to scale fast and, okay. and fail forward, because many companies uh, which are trying to make it, they don't survive the stage from the very early stage. Uh, when they finish the product market fit, to just know how to get uh, the 10x uh, growth. 
and uh, it's easy here because the US is a big market. Uh, Europe is, is a bunch of small, smaller parts uh, they speak in different languages. Uh, and there are some other issues as well. Are, are you saying Europeans speak in different languages? <laughs> and the customers do. Yes. And it's, it's kind of uh, another layer of complexity, yeah. but it's getting better now. Okay. Marco, any, any final closing thoughts? Well, I, I think I could follow up from that. So I think one of the biggest issues in Europe is this fragmentation. I mean, we have excellent places for companies to start and, you know, build businesses and, and leave their team in Portugal, as you've done, and so forth. That's, you know, that's there. But then how do we actually, what's the benefit for the Portuguese to be in Europe so that you can connect easily to guys in London and Berlin? And, you know, so that's still missing. I think we need to have more of that kind of... Uh, dynamics in Europe. Okay. Thank you, Marco. And Andreas, I'll give you the, the last word here. Yeah, I think um, in Europe, people have to start think bigger. And this is also living in this fragmented market. Uh, you, you, have to think, you have to think on a global perspective. And this is what US companies, for example, do pretty good and then have a big vision, work on your product and then make it successful. So uh, we'd like to thank each of you for, um, in some of your cases, coming from London, Coimbra, Vienna, Oulu. Thank you very much to each of you. Uh, please give them a hand. Thank you.